We are joined by Mr. Rajan Goyal, a registered migration agent working at OSIS Group Perth. So he has over six years of experience in Australian migration practice. He has a strong um, comprehension of migration law, which helps him to prepare a strong application for his clients. Uh, this facilitates the clients to receive the positive outcome on their visa applications within the immigration prescribed processing time with minimal risk of visa refusal. So um, we are so glad that you guys have joined us. Uh, we are, our expert will be taking your questions. Please post your questions and we will answer as many as we can in this limited amount of time. So um, also we have some exciting uh giveaways for our attendees uh we want to take this session deep and uh, interactive we encourage uh all the questions and feedback we have bumble cash price claim for the ones um we have bumble cash prices for the claims for the ones who leave most descriptive review under the facebook post i have shared in the chat box and also um, tag your friends uh, at OSIS Education Summit 2022 in the comment section along with your feedback, please. Uh, the most participative, participative, <coughs> sorry, participative uh, audience member from the chat box is eligible for free giveaways uh, such as free PT coaching, IELTS coaching, PR consultations, etc. Uh, we encourage you to become a part of our summit. Uh, thank you once again. I'll um, ask Mr. Rajan to join. So over to you, Rajan, please. Thank you, Tushara. Um, hello, friends. My name is Rajan Goyal. I'm a registered migration agent at Aussie East Perth. Um, I actually for, uh, work from Perth CBD branch in Perth. Uh, welcome to the Education Summit 2022. Um, today we are going to talk about engineering occupations. We're going to talk about uh, how to get a skills assessment for these occupations, and we are also going to talk about how to get um, a migration pathway under these occupations. So I'm just going to share my slides with you um, in a second. OK, as I said earlier, today's topic is about the engineering programs, so skills assessment and the future migration pathways to Australia. Um, first of all, uh, let's talk about um, exactly what does what do we mean by skills assessment? And why do we need it? Um, in Australia, for most of the uh, visas under the skilled migration pathway, uh, one needs to have an occupation. And when I say that one needs to have an occupation, what I essentially mean is that one needs to have a skills assessment for an occupation. Because unless you have a skills assessment for an occupation, you do not have an occupation. There are very few visas in Australia for which you might not need the skills assessment for an occupation. Uh, in which case only experience and the educational qualifications might suffice. But otherwise, for most of the visas under the skilled migration category in Australia, whether those visas be independent visas or state sponsored or family sponsored visas, um, an applicant needs to have an occupation and, and needs to have a skills assessment for an occupation. So it's very important that uh, one must have a skills assessment. Uh, otherwise, we, we just by studying an engineering degree, even from Australia, does not make us an engineer for migration purposes. So let's say somebody does a bachelor's of engineering here uh, from an Australian university. That doesn't mean that after they complete their bachelor's, they can simply call themselves a mechanical engineer or a civil engineer uh, on, on the basis of their qualifications. They have to get their degree assessed first, and when they get a positive outcome saying that uh, they've got this occupation, they've got the skills assessment for a particular occupation, only then they could claim that they've got an occupation uh, and engineering occupations for, for the migration purposes in Australia. So it, it's very important that one applies for the skills assessment. Uh, skills assessment is done by a body which is designated by the Department of Home Affairs uh, to undertake uh, such an assessment. Uh, in engineering uh, occupations, uh, uh, are the engineering occupations are all assessed by a body called Engineers Australia. So they have a certain criteria under which uh, they assess the degree. Um, I, I mean, as they give you the skill assessment for an occupation. Uh, mostly the criteria is qualifications based, but there are other elements to this criteria as well that you have to have a certain amount of English. Um, you have to have 
you ha might have to um, declare, you might have to prove your competency in the engineering occupations. So there are various elements to this criteria, which I'm going to explain to you in a minute. But the body which assesses the skills assessment um, for engineering occupations is called Engineers Australia. And please be, um, please uh, feel free to uh, post your questions. I'll be taking the questions and answering them from time to time during the session itself. Um, so there are four categories in engineering occupations. Uh, the first category is professional engineer. So under the professional engineer category, there are the occupations such as uh, you can uh, occupations such as mechanical engineer, civil engineer, electrical engineer, uh, electronics engineer. Now in this category, the applicant needs to have a skill level one, which is uh, an equivalent of Australian bachelors. Uh, so one an applicant must have done a four years bachelors after their class 12 in order to get a skills assessment for an occupation which falls under this category, uh, which is professional engineer. So if you if somebody wants to get an assessment for mechanical engineer, let's say they must have studied a four year bachelors after their after their uh, uh, class 12 in order to be able to successfully get a skills assessment for a mechanical engineer. Uh, the second category is engineering technologist. Um, now, this this is also equivalent to um, uh, skill level one, which means that one sh uh, the applicant should have studied um, a bachelor level deg level degree. But in this case, uh, the degree does not need to be four year bachelors. The, uh, even a three year bachelors will suffice for the skills assessment for an, as an engineering technologist. So somebody who's just studied three years of engineering degree, uh, uh, like a bachelor's, they can get a successful skills assessment for engineering technologist. Uh, the third one is engineering associate. Uh, so this, uh, the occupations falling under this category only require a skill level two, which means that the applicant should have at least studied an advanced diploma uh, in the in, uh, uh, in the nominated occupation or would have done the done an associate degree. Um, so the various occupations that come under this category could be uh, a mechanical engineer, draftsperson, electrical engineer, draftsperson. A telecom a telecommunications network planner, uh, a telecommunications field engineer. So all these occupations come under this cat under this category, which is engineering associates. Uh, under this category, as I said, you only need to have done an advanced diploma or an associate degree. You do not need to have a bachelor's degree to get a skills assessment under the, the uh, for the occupation under this category. And the fourth one, which Engineers Australia recognizes, is that of uh, managers. Uh, so under the manager's category, uh, one needs to have a skill level one, which is a four year bachelor's degree uh, uh, equivalent to Australian standards. Um, and plus they should at, at least have five years of experience as a professional engineer after they would have completed their degree. Only then one could be because employment experience is must uh, in order to be able to get a successful skills assessment for engineering manager. So if you've got five years of at least five years of experience as a professional engineer, um, uh, then then um, you could possibly get the skills assessment for engineering manager if you meet the rest of the criteria as well. So let's have a look at the various engineering occupations that are there in the in the various uh, migration list. Um, so we've got engineering manager, and we, uh, we you can see the ANSCO codes of these occupations as well. So ANSCO is um, Australia and New Zealand standard classification of occupations. So if you go onto this uh, website, which is Australian Bureau of Statistics, uh, you'll see various occupations and the duties and the tasks related to each of these occupations on that website. So um, and so these are the occupations which Engineers Australia assesses, um, like chemical engineer, materials engineer. Uh, some of these occupations are on the MLT SSL list, some are not, but most of them are. Um, um, so so you can see the entire list of occupations here, which which are there on the MLT SSL list here uh, that are assessed by Engineers Australia. Now, speaking of uh, skills assessment criteria under Engineers Australia, the the qualif it's it's basically a qualifications based assessment. So you just have to prove your qualifications. Your work experience is not mandatory after your qualifications, if you're getting a skills assessment for an engineering occupations, other uh, uh, except for the engineering managers, as I said before, you have to have five years of experience for engineering managers skills assessment. But other than that category, for all of the categories, whether it be a professional engineer or an engineering technologist or um, um, an associate engineer, 
uh, one can get the qualification, uh, one can get the assessment on the basis of the qualifications only. Now, Engineers Australia divides qualifications into two categories. One is accredited qualification and the other is non-accredited qualification. Under the accredited qualifications, we've got Australian qualifications. We've got uh, the qualifications which uh, are um, under the Washington Accord, uh, under the Sydney Accord and under the Dublin Accord. Now, for each of these qualifications, um, so let's say if you talk about the Australian qualifications, uh, Engineers Australia has given a list of occupations on the website, which Australian qualifications are accredited by Engineers Australia for the purposes of migration. Now the migration skills assessment. Now, not every qualification in Australia is uh, recognized and accredited by um, Engineers Australia. So you have to bear in mind that you go and have a look at the, that list before you can apply under the accredited qualifications pathway uh and see that the the your engineering degree is on that list otherwise you will have to uh, if it is not on that list you will have to go on uh, under the non accredited qualifications pathway so under the accredited qualifications pathway there are other accords as well so people who've studied overseas as well uh they can um if if the degree is um uh, falls under washington accord they can uh, apply under the accredited qualifications pathway um, so, for example, in India, there are many colleges and many universities where which fall under the Washington Accord. Uh, so, if if you've done a degree from one of those colleges, and your and and your uh, degree was actually accredited under Washington Accord at the time you graduated from that degree, then you can possibly apply under the Washington Accord pathway. Now, the um, the requirements to apply under the accredited qualifications pathway are much less then uh, when you apply under the non accredited qualifications pathway. So um, so double check uh, whether your degree can possibly come under the accredited qualifications pathway. And if it does, then it is a simple qualifications based uh, assessment. You just have to submit your uh, qualifications, your English test and other things which are listed on the Engineers Australia website, and you can possibly get a uh, positive skills assessment for the occupation that you're trying to uh, get the assessment for. Um, under the non accredited qualifications, obviously, if your qualification does not fall under Australian qualifications or under the Washington Accord or under the Sydney Accord or under the Dublin Accord, then unfortunately you will have to go under uh, the non accredited qualifications pathway, which is a CDR pathway. Um, I'll just um, so under the CDR pathway, uh, one has to make career ep uh, career episode, uh, uh, episodes. So one has to make three career episodes. Uh, under the CDR pathway, which is which is like the, a career episode is a, like a thousand word to twenty five hundred words essay, um, which uh, a person has to write, which can be based on uh, a project that you might have done during your engineers uh, uh, engineering qualification or your employment uh, that you might uh, have done in the past or you're still doing as an engineer. It could be done on any other engineering task that you may have undertaken either during your qualifications or after your qualifications. So it is basically in that essay you have to show how um, you just have to prove your competency and how you actually approached a particular engineering um, problem and how you actually ended up solving it. So it's a thousand to twenty five hundred words essay that one has to prepare. You have to prepare three career episodes under the non accredited qualifications pathway. So along with the career, uh, three career episodes, one has to prepare a CPD statement as well. Uh, it's just a CPD statement is something that uh, tells the case officer how you've kept in touch with your engineering uh, studies or your engineering occupation. So you could have uh, any any uh, subscriptions that you might have regarding the engineering uh, qualifications and any further qualifications you might have done, any employments, uh, uh, an engineering employment episode that you might have undertaken. So you have to list all that in the in the CPD statement, and then you have to make a summary statement as well, which is basically. Uh, um, just a summary of the career episodes and how you've used um, various knowledge competencies in your career episodes. Uh, it's just a way to show uh, show that to the case officer. So as you can imagine, um, um, accredited qualifications pathway is much simpler than um, much simpler than non-accredited qualifications pathway. As in, we do not have to make career episodes in the accredited qualifications pathway. So under the accredited pathway, these are the things that are required. So obviously you require your identification documents. Uh, you require your academic uh, certificate and your transcripts and your completion letters and all other documents in relation to your uh, qualifications. 
you need to give your um, uh, curriculum vitae uh, uh, to the case officer. You also need to give you uh, uh, give the English test results. So you have to have a minimum score of uh, six in all the components or equivalent in IELTS in order to be able to uh, uh, successfully pass the English requirement. Um, but there are exemptions as well. So somebody who's done uh, a bachelor's or a master's, or uh, at least a two years master's in Australia, could possibly be exempted from the English requirement. And in that case, uh, you do not have to give your English test and you can just submit your application without the English test results. But otherwise you need six each in IELTS or equivalent in PTE or TOEFL or IBT. OK, um, somebody is writing. Um, oh, yeah. Can you please share a presentation slide to see what's being discussed for reference? Um, I hope we can. Uh, you can all see my presentation slides uh, on the screen. Um, I'll just confirm that with my host. Uh, Tashara, can we see the uh, presentation slides on the screen? Uh, I can see only one like engineers of Australia skills assessment. Just that one. OK, thank you for pointing that out. Um, uh, I, I thought that my uh, um, slides were being shown on the screen, but um, uh, thank you for pointing me, uh, pointing that out to me. But I hope you can see the slides now. Is that correct, Tashara? They can see yes, the slides yes. now? Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. we can see the screen. All right, so I'll just um, quickly um, just play the slides from the beginning so that you can have a quick look. So I've discussed what is skills assessment and why do we need it. Um, the body is Engineers Australia. These are the categories under the engineering occupations um, and the skill level required. These are the various engineering occupations uh, on the MLTSSL list. I'll just um, explain you what the MLTSSL list stands for as well later in the session today. And these are the pathways, uh, accredited qualifications and non-accredited qualifications. Um, um, under the Australian, um, uh, under the accredited qualifications, we've got Australian qualifications, uh, qualifications approved under Washington Accord, Sydney Accord, and Dublin Accord. If you your qualification is not under one of these categories, then you'll have to go under the non-accredited qualifications pathway, and you have to make career episodes, summary statement, and CPD statements. Um, just to let you know, somebody who does not have any employment episode or somebody who hasn't done any projects um, during their engineering studies and who is not uh, and whose qualifications is not under the accredited qualifications pathway. Now, it will be obviously be very hard for them to make career episodes because they've got nothing on which they can possibly make the career episodes on. In that case, you can also do an associate degree in Australia and that, uh, like an accredited qualification uh, and that way you won't have to make the career episode any anymore. So after you've done the associate degree, you can simply your degree, your professional engineering degree would be recognized and you can get a skills assessment on the basis of just your qualifications and you wouldn't have to make any career episodes anymore. So just a point to note uh, in case somebody cannot make career episodes for some reason. So under the accredited pathway, we need the identification documents, we need the degree certificate, we need the official ac uh, academic transcript, uh, curriculum vitae, English test results. And as I said earlier, there are exemptions for English test results as well. If you've done a master's or a bachelor's in Australia, you would not need um, the English test results. Um, under the CDR pathway, uh, as I said earlier, the requirements are much more. So you have to prepare your personal documentation like your identification document uh, documentation. And you have to nominate a, a professional occupation category as well. So uh, under the CDR pathway, you are the, the applicant is the one who nominates an occupation. Um, so um, under the Australian pathway, uh, you do not nominate an occupation. You just submit the qualifications to Engineers Australia and they come back and uh, give you uh, an occupation which you which your qualifications might be eligible for. But under the CDR pathway, the applicant has to choose an occupation. So somebody who's done electronics engineer, uh, engineering, and the career episodes are based on electronics engineering as well, uh, can um, uh, will have to nominate electronics engineer as the occupation uh, in the application as part of the application. So obviously you need your academics like your certificate, your transcripts, and any other relevant academic, academic documentations. Um, you need evidence of employment. 
Now, as I said earlier, evidence of employment is not necessary unless you're going for the skills assessment for engineering uh, manager. Uh, you can get your employment uh, experience uh, assessed by Engineers Australia. Uh, if you are going to claim employment for points purposes uh, later on, but that's not mandatory. But at the same time, you can you have the option of getting your employment assessed as well. If you want to be sure that your employment is relevant to your nominated occupation and uh, you can and the engineers Australia can assess your employment as well, but it's not mandatory. And even if you get your employment assessed by engineers Australia, the case officer will later on uh, review your review the your employment document uh, documents independently, regardless of what the engineers Australia has written in the letter. But obviously, uh, you'll get a sort of assurance that uh, mostly the case officers will uh, give you a positive outcome once engineers Australia has um, assessed your employment and has assessed it as positive and closely related to your nominated occupation. And the last and the the major step which take most which takes most of the times under this pathway is that you have to prepare the CPD statement. You have to write three career episodes and you have to write the summary statement as well. And somebody who doesn't want to do that can do will have to do an associate degree in order to get a successful skills assessment. Now, a word of caution here. There are there are people out there who who advertise as uh, like they can write the career episodes on your behalf. I've seen so many cases where Engineers Australia uh, uh, has actually banned people for 12 months. Um, and so it is it is. So you have the career episodes must be your own work. Uh, otherwise, there could be serious consequences, uh, the least of which is a refusal. Uh, and they could you could also get a ban of 12 months from Engineers Australia. So uh, uh, after you've applied for your skills assessment, uh, if you get a refusal and a 12 month ban for the for the next one year, you would not be able to reapply for the skills assessment. So you've lost and if you've got no other occupation that you can possibly get the skills assessment in, then possibly you've lost that one year. And it's very hard as well after that one year as well to to get the assessment again sometimes. Um, so this is a checklist for uh, applying. Um, the, uh, the skills assessment under the CDR pathway. So identification documents, uh, academic degree um, uh, certificate, um, curriculum vitae as. So the first four are obviously similar to the first five actually are very similar to the, the Australian accredited uh, pathway. Um, then we have uh, CPD statements, three career episodes and the summary statement as well. Um, now. I've explained the skills assessment process. Um, this was the entire skills assessment process with Engineers Australia. So you're more than uh, more than welcome to leave uh, comments right now or email us later uh, regarding any of your questions regarding the skills assessment process uh, for engineering occupations or for other occupations as well. But since this session is particularly about the engineering occupations, you, you're more than welcome to leave your comments and your and send us your queries. Uh, either on our Facebook page or other other avenues regarding your uh, uh, regarding your skills assessment uh, process. So obviously most of the if we talk about the uh, visa options for, for the engineering occupations. Now there are many occupations which are on various lists, uh, skilled migration list in Australia. Um, I'll just explain the visa process first a little bit. Um, so we've got these three categories of visa under the general skilled migration visas. Obviously, there's another category of employer sponsored visas, uh, but under the general skilled migration visas or under the points based visas, we've got these three main categories. Uh, the first one is subclass 189, which is an independent visa. Uh, now uh, this is, uh, an, as the name suggests, an independent visa. Nobody sponsors you here. This is a uh, this is a visa uh, which is uh, by the Department of Home Affairs, so you need a minimum of 65 points. Uh, to uh, to be eligible uh, to put up an expression of interest under this category, you must have a full skills assessment. Um, so when we say that you must have a full skills assessment, we say this because uh, you can also get a provisional skills assessment for a temporary graduate visa. But for the general skill migration visas, you need a full assessment rather than just a provisional assessment, which is only required for the graduate visa. Uh, a minimum of six each in in IELTS or equivalent in PT and other uh, and TOEFL are required under this category, and it's a permanent visa, of course, subclass one eight nine. Now, 
under this visa, obviously you become eligible at 65 points, but we all know that one doesn't get invited at 65 points because there are a lot of people standing in the queue already. Um, so the cutoff normally goes as high as 95 points, 90 points for the engineering occupations for 189 visa. Uh, and and one another thing to keep in mind is that there are not many seats uh, allocated to this category. Most of the seats are allocated under the state sponsorship category or employer sponsorship category and other categories. So uh, in my opinion, unless somebody has very high points, uh, one should not depend on this category, under this category. One should make themselves eligible under one of the states, if possible, rather than relying on this category and sitting at, uh, let's say, 90 points and waiting for, for an invitation under this category. Uh, because the rounds are held after every three months, and as I said, the, said there are not many allocations under this category uh, in any given financial year. One should not rely under this category. One should make uh, himself or herself um, eligible for one of the states uh, if that's possible for them, of course. Um, so the second category under the general skilled migration visas is 190. Um, uh, so subclass 190 is um, uh, again a permanent visa which is sponsored by a state. So as I said earlier, these are all points based visas where you need points. Uh, plus, you, uh, but in the 190 and 491 category, you have to meet the state criteria as well, along with the points. So just the points are not enough. Under the 189 category, you need points, plus your occupation ha has to be on the MLT SSL list. But in 190 and 491, which are state-sponsored uh, visas, uh, you need the points, plus you need to meet, uh, meet the state criteria as well. Now, one of that criteria could be that your occupation has to be on the state list. And now every state has their own list. Uh, so you just have to go uh, on each state's website and have a look at what the list is and whether your occupation is there on that list or not. Under the 190, you get five points from the state. So even if you have 60 points of your own, uh, you still become eligible for um, for this visa because the minimum eligibility points uh, cut off is 65 points. But once you have 60 points of your own, then you get five points from the state and you uh, your total becomes 65 points. Again, you need full assessment. You need six each, and it's a permanent visa, as I said earlier. Now, it says six each year, but as I said, the state cr criteria could override this and specifically state that you need seven each or any other IELTS score. So you have to look at the state criteria, what exactly uh, the other criteria is, in order to be able to determine whether you qualify under this category. Uh, under the 491, which is uh, again a state sponsored visa, there's a, another um, stream in that uh, visa, which is family sponsored as well. I'll come to that in a second. Uh, but under the 491 visa, uh, you get 15 points from the state. So somebody who doesn't have many points of their own, and they only have, let's say, 50 points of their own, and they're not able to make 60 points, then one could uh, still be eligible under the 491 visa because under this category, you get 15 points from the state. Um, so, and obviously, uh, some of the states. Um, are only sponsoring for 491 for most of the uh, applications because they want you under the 491 visa. The 491 visa is temporary visa which you get for five years, uh, but you have to remain in the state for three years. Um, and and obviously the criteria for this 491 visa is generally uh, a little bit easier than the 190 criteria a state has. Say for example, South Australia might say that for electrical engineer one needs to have one year of experience in South Australia. To qualify for 190, but for 491, you only you only might require six months of experience to qualify for 491. So you get 15 points from the state, and the criteria is a, a little bit lenient as well. So it might be a good option to get 491 visa. It's a very good visa to have as well. You get Medicare card. All you have to do is work for three years, earn a minimum uh, income in those three years, and then you will uh, most probably qualify for the permanent visa, which is the 191 visa. Other requirements for this visa remain the same: that you have to have full assessment. Um, uh, you have to have a minimum of six each. Uh, well, as I said, this is just a general requirement and you have to go and look at the state's website, whether they have any other specific requirements uh, regarding the English criteria or any other criteria that they might have. So some states might say that you need to have a little bit of experience as well, like a six months, one year. Some states might say that you have to have a job of a letter in your nominated occupation. So it depends on the state criteria. So you have to so not only you need the points under the state sponsorship, you need to meet the state criteria as well. So just remember that. Uh, and your occupation has to be on the state list as well, whatever state says. 
uh, your occupation has to be on that particular state's list as well, whichever you're trying to get nominated from. OK, moving on to the next slide. Um, now, before I come to these occupation ceilings, um, let me go through the uh, various state criteria as well. Um, so I'll just briefly touch upon the various state criteria. As I said earlier, it's always it's much easier to get state uh, invitation from a state if you meet the criteria, obviously, then uh, just relying on the independent category because the points cutoff is very high in that category and the invitation rounds do not happen so often. And um, it's it's not a good idea to rely in under that category. Um, so and if we talk about the states, so I, I am actually based out of Perth. Uh, WA has two streams, which is one is general stream and one is um, uh, graduate stream. Now there are many engineering occupations under both these streams. So under so I'm, I'm just going to talk about the state criteria here, right? I'm just going to touch about the touch upon the briefly touch upon the state criteria. So under the WA state nomination, under the graduate stream, one has to have studied in WA for at least two years. Now it doesn't mean that your studies should be related to your engineering occupations. Uh, occupation. If you've nominated one engineer, let's say you've nominated a mechanical engineer and you got the skills assessment of that occupation based on your bachelor's, which was studied overseas. Uh, your studies in uh, WA could be entirely different from your nominated occupation. Let's say uh, you've done masters of community uh, welfare or if you've done advanced diploma in leadership and management. As long as you've studied two years in WA, you would meet the criteria under the graduate stream, right? Well, there are other criteria as well, like you have to have seven each um, uh, and you have to have either six months of work experience or you have to have six months job offer letter from an employer based in WA. So um, under the graduate stream, the, the major criteria is that you have to have studied in WA for at least two years. Under the general stream, there's no such criteria that you should have studied in WA. As long as you've got a skills assessment for an occupation, under the general stream, you could possibly be eligible. Uh, uh, so you have to first go and look at the general stream and see whether your occupation is on there or not. If you have an occupation on, uh, on that list and you've got a skills assessment for that occupation, you are basically eligible under the uh, under the general stream. Uh, after you get invited, you also have to give 12 months employment contract from an employer based in WA. But at the, at the time of putting an expression of interest, you do not need such employment contract. So if you've got a skills assessment and you meet the minimum points criteria, you can actually uh, straight away launch an expression of interest for WA state sponsorship under the general stream. Um, this is just I'm specifically saying uh, this for the engineering occupations here. Um, now, South Australia has various uh, options as well, even for interstate people. So. Uh, um, uh, so somebody who studied from not studied from South Australia, they can go and work in the nominated occupation from uh, for at least six months or closely related occupation as well uh, and, and get nominated for 491. Um, and, and, and obviously, if you work for one year, for a majority of the engineering occupations, you would be eligible for 190 state uh, nomination under the South Australian State Nomination Program. Obviously, there are exemptions for South Australian graduates and there are exemptions available for people who are working uh, in the regional sectors of South, uh, South Australia. Um, under the uh, under the Victorian state nomination, um, their their skills assessment, uh, their nomination uh, program is hugely uh, sort of um, so determined by the pandemic. So they've got these target sectors there. So if you're working in one of those target sectors like digital healthcare, uh, in your nominated and using your STEM skills as well, like your engineering skills, and you're working in your nom uh, nominated occupation or closely related occupation you could possibly get invited for Victorian 190 or 491. Um, Tasmania has this criteria where you, you should have either studied from Tasmania or you should be working in Tasmania for at least six months uh, uh, to one year, depending on whether uh, whether you want to nominate yourself for uh, 190 or 491. Um, under the NSW, NSW 190, um, now NSW 190, um, recently made some changes in the occupation list. So they added um, a three year experience requirements to uh, uh, some occupations on the list. But uh, as far as I know, I, I don't think that most of the engineering occupations do not still have this requirement. So you just have to be living and working, either living and working in NSW uh, or 
or you should be at least living there for three months in order to be able to uh, become eligible under the NSW 190 nomination. Now, but we know that um, NSW, the cutoff, because the criteria is not that hard, the nomination is not, um, the points cutoff in NSW state nomination goes pretty high for engineering occupations. It could go as high as 90 points, 85 points in some, uh, some cases uh, under the NSW 190. As far as NSW 491 is concerned, we've got three streams there. Uh, stream 1, Stream 2, Stream 3. Stream 1 is when you are living and working in a regional area of NSW. Uh, your occupation has to be on the combined list there. They've got a list which is called the combined occupation list. So if your occupation is on there and you've been living and working in a regional area for at least 12 months, you would be eligible under the uh, NSW 491 regional um, uh, state sponsorship. Um, well, they do invite people uh, after, even after three months of experience on a case by case basis. Uh, under the stream two and stream three, um, you have to have your occupation under the region's preferred occupation list. So uh, under the stream one, it is the combined occupation list, but under the stream three uh, and stream two, uh, the region has a preferred occupation list. So you have to have, so this, this is a separate list from the combined occupation list. So you have to have a look there whether you have your occupation there or not. Stream two is when you've studied in a region for two years, stream three is when you've got an assessment um, for an occupation that is on the list. Uh, so stream three is obviously the easiest, and we've seen that people who are residing in a regional area uh, of NSW already, although that is not the criteria, but people who are residing there and working and living in one of the regions there will only be the ones who are getting invited under the stream three normally. Um, similarly, um, uh, Queensland has this criteria um, uh, for both 190 and, and 491. For 190, they've, uh, so, they've, so they've got two criteria there, graduate criteria, and if you are uh, working in uh, Queensland as well. Just bear with me. Let me just have a look at the questions. So yeah, most uh, under the graduate category under in the Queensland State Nomination Program, uh, they would only nominate you for 190. Uh, if you've done a PhD there, but for most of the masters and bachelors um, uh, who've studied masters and bachelors from Queensland University, uh, they will only get nominated under the 491 uh, stream. Um, there are other criteria as well that you should have a certain GPA, um, um, you should have um, have proficient English. Proficient English means seven each. Um, have a minimum of three works, uh, three uh, three months of work experience as well. Uh, in your nominated or closely related uh, occupation after you have graduated, and you need to have a job of a letter of minimum to, uh, 20 hours per week for the next 12 months as well. So as I said earlier, you have to make sure that you look at the state criteria properly. So in under the state nomination program, not only you need to meet, have the points, but the most important part normally is that you need to meet the state criteria, and you need to study the state criteria uh, carefully and, and make sure that you meet each and every state criteria in order to get a successful nomination from from the states. Um, and obviously, if you haven't graduated from Queensland, you can actually. Um, um, uh, if you're you, you could be working there uh, for 190 visa, uh, if you if you're working there for at least six months in your nominated occupation uh, and the employment has to be full time uh, prior to submitting your EY. So so make sure you submit your EY only after you've completed that six months work experience requirement, only then you would be eligible for uh, 190. And for 491, um, as I said earlier, the criteria is normally easier, and uh, it is easier in Queensland's case as well, uh, that you only have to have three years uh, experience rather than the six months requirement, or sorry, three months requirement, rather than the six months requirement under the 190. So you should be working for three months at least in your nominated occupation uh, prior, to submit, uh, prior to submitting your EUI. Uh, for the Queensland. Uh, and obviously there are other requirements as well, uh, such as uh, you must provide evidence of ongoing employment uh, and the business should be uh, well established and and uh, and similar things. Um, so so these are the state nomination issue, uh, criteria. Um, I think we just got a question here. So somebody's written here, is Australia now open or when is it going to open for the different streams pathways? Um, I think they are trying to ask me whether it is open for, obviously Australia is open for onshore candidates, but some of the states have now opened for offshore as well, like for example, NSW. NSW has uh, come out with a list uh, recently uh, where the occupations are also open for offshore applicants. 
So you just need to meet the additional criteria, uh, like whatever the additional criteria might be. So, but most of the states and most of the occupations are only open for onshore applicants at the moment. So they're not open for offshore, uh, but some of the states, as I said, have uh, gradually started opening up for offshore applicants too. So, um, yeah, so I hope you would have understood that um, a little bit of criteria that every state has. Uh, so it's very important uh, that you actually understand that criteria. So somebody, uh, let's say, is not able to uh, fulfill the criteria of one particular state. They can move into another state as well and fulfill the criteria. Like, like for example, somebody could come to WA and start studying here for two years in order to become eligible under the WA state nomination program. And then uh, after those two years, obviously, they can possibly get invited uh, from, from WA. Or somebody who's sitting in WA can go to South Australia and find a job in the nominated occupation, work there for six months or one year, depending on uh, what are the requirements for that particular occupation. Then they can possibly qualify under the state nomination program for South Australia as well. So you just have to just have to make sure that you make yourself eligible uh, for one of the states. Um, as I said, I just um, cannot reiterate that enough that do not rely on 189 because sometimes the points cut off under the 189 category goes much higher. And people who do not have their occupation on the MLT SSL list, which is the list for the 189 visas, uh, then obviously they cannot qualify under the uh, uh, 189, even if they have higher points. They will have to uh, make themselves eligible under the state nomination pathway or the family sponsored pathway as well. So just um, Going back to the 491 family sponsorship, um, again, the criteria remains the same. If you've got uh, uh, 50 points of your own, you get 15 points from, from an eligible relative here. Now, what's an eligible relative? Uh, eligible relative could be your brother, your sister, your first cousin, your uncle, your aunt, and there are other uh, relations as well. Uh, obviously, it has to be a very close relative. Uh, if you've got a relative who's a permanent resident and a citizen and who's living in regional Australia, so and bear in mind that Entire Australia is regional at the moment, uh, other, other than uh, Sydney metropolitan area, Brisbane metropolitan and uh, Melbourne metropolitan. So if you've got a first cousin, let's say, living in Canberra and who's a permanent resident, then you become eligible under this category. Um, so and it doesn't matter where you, uh, what your location is. So you could be living in Sydney, which is not regional. But as long as your relative is living in a regional area, let's say Canberra or Adelaide or Perth, you, you would become eligible under this uh, category. Um, obviously, the points cut off in this category also, this is not uh, a state sponsored visa. This is directly uh, given to you, uh, given to the applicant by the Department of Home Affairs. Um, uh, the cutoff goes a little higher than this norm normally state sponsorship sponsored visas. So one could expect a cutoff of around 80 points for most of the popular occupations, for engineering occupations specifically. So you've got 80 points of your own. You get 15 points from the uh, from the from, for the eligible relative. That takes your total to 95 points. And I think that's a good total uh, score to have to, uh, to get invited under this category as well. Um, so these are the occupations ceilings um, for in various engineering occupations. Now, uh, the well, the department has not published these occupation ceilings for this year. But the, the, these are the figures from the last year, so they've got a certain ceiling after which they cannot invite applicants under these occupations uh, anymore. So let's say for electrical engineers, they've got a ceiling of 1,348. Uh, I just, I just, yeah. Sorry, to interrupt. sorry. Uh, can you please share your screen? All right, thanks for that, Tushara. Um, so yeah, so we've got, I was talking about the occupation ceilings. Uh, so various engineering occupations have uh, uh, ceilings given to them uh, by the department. So after the ceiling has been reached, the department cannot invite uh, an applicant for these occupations. Um, now, some of the engineering occupations are pro rata occupations as well. Uh, now, the pro rata, by pro rata occupations, we mean that in, in a particular invitation round, only a particular number of invitations are given out for that particular occupation. So let's say um, uh, for electronics engineer, the ceiling is 1,000. Uh, but if it falls under the pro rata category, uh, then then obviously uh, they could have a, a ceiling of 200 for a particular invitation round so that uh, the, in, the a balanced number of invitations are issued throughout the year. So all the invitations are not exhausted in one because um, these are very popular occupations under which for which they have a ceiling and for which they have a pro rata method as well. 
and they get a lot of applications under those occupations. So they want to make sure that these occupations uh, keep getting invited throughout the year and, and not just in one round. So they can have those pro rata uh, uh, things applied to those occupations as well. Um, so as I was talking about, the, I'm based out of Perth and I've just got this WA graduate occupation list in front of me. So as you could see, there are, there are a huge number of engineering occupations uh, in this list. So one under the graduate occupation list, one has to have a, obviously a skills assessment. As I said earlier, skills assessment is a must for every occupation. You have to have studied in WA for two years as well, and there, you should be have you should have proficient English, and you should either have a six months employment contract, or you should have six months employment experience in your nominated occupation as well. Now there's another list which is the general list. There are a huge number of engineering occupations on that list as well. So um, obviously um, WA is um, a good state for engineering uh, occupations at the moment. Um, so this is just the data from the Department of Home Affairs website for the last invitation round. So this is just for the 189 and 491. So they have not uh, published most of the data here, but they've just given us the figures for industrial, mechanical and production engineers. The cutoff was 90 points. So basically nobody who had a score uh, less than 90 points got invited in the October round for 189 visas. Uh, and the cutoff for other occupations uh, is very similar as well. Um, uh, so as I said earlier, one should not be relying on 189 because uh, the, invita the invitations that are happening under the 189 category for the past two years are, are, are targeted invitations. Not all occupations are getting invited. Uh, so they're only inviting um, um, th those occupations which are needed uh, in Australia in this in these COVID times. So they are they are issuing targeted invitations at the moment. So obviously, as I said earlier, if you have any questions, uh, you can email us, um, or you can actually um, uh, uh, WhatsApp us or write it down on Facebook. Um, there are various avenues. So just bear with me. Just all right, viewers. Thank you for joining the education summit the session of this education summit today. Um, I hope uh, you got an idea about the skills assessment process for engineering occupations here uh, in Australia, as well as the various state nominations. Um, uh, and feel free to write down questions and send us your queries later on. Thank you, Rajan. And thank you very much all for attending. Uh, don't forget to leave your reviews for this section. And uh, if you have more questions, please feel free to put in the chat box. OK, um, I think there is no more question. So and uh, your feedback is much appreciated. Uh, also, don't miss out our next section uh, on exciting topics. So I'll be sharing a few links so that you can uh, join our next section. You can join straight away through the link uh, put in the chat box. And as I mentioned, thank you very much for attending this section. Yeah, hope you can see all the links I shared. You can just straight away uh, click through the link and join all the sections. Please uh, feel free to give us feedback. And thank you very much for attending.